Next, uh, we want to turn to uh, a person who has a very difficult job. Um, she, is, uh, she was on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom and had to join John Bolton and Elliot Abrams for such a commission. Uh, but she also has an easy job. She happens to be my wife. <laughs> so that's, but that's not why she's speaking. She's speaking because she has an important uh, story to tell as well in terms of her tenure as a commissioner appointed by President uh, Bill Clinton back in the 90s and a visit to Jerusalem and some observations uh, as it relates to the current conflict. Her, her father, who passed away in 2000, uh, was from Khan Yunus, and her family has already lost over 50 members. Uh, so it takes a lot for Leila to come and, and speak, so we just appreciate the time that she's able to spend with all of us. Please welcome Dr. Leila Almariadi. Thank you so much. It's great to be here at All Saints, where I feel always feel welcome and among friends um, uh, and supporters and solidarity. I, I thought you were going to say the harder job was being mar married to you. <laughs> but that has been, you know, speaking of having that solidarity and support, especially at a time in my life when I was asked to serve on this Commission on International Religious Freedom. Some of you may recall events around that time, and, and uh, I wanted to just share my experience. And listening to the, the other speakers, the relevance of some of these other issues related to the role of uh, Israel, Palestine, in these uh, visions of restoration, if you will, dispensationalism and so forth, all also played out in the United States in the formation of this commission and in the establishment of the International Religious Freedom Act. <clears throat> this also occurred at a very challenging time in my life. Um, as Salam mentioned, uh, my father passed away in 2000, very unexpectedly. It was the same year we gave birth to our third child. And all throughout this, I was uh, practicing medicine as an OBGYN uh, and then uh, was called to serve on this commission. And in the legacy of the Hattuts, the late Dr. Hassan, Dr. Maher, we were basically told uh, uh, as their um, mentees, we never had the right of refusal when we were asked to serve because we were, this was what we were called to do. So it was a very challenging time for me personally. And just telling you about my experience, you'll probably understand why as well. So in 1998, the International Religious Freedom Act was enacted to elevate religious freedom as a higher priority in U.S. foreign policy. Um, and this is according to the U.S. CIRF, Commission on International Religious Freedom website, focused on promoting religious freedom as recognized in international law, particularly as enshrined in the U.N. Declaration for Human Rights. Central to this act was the establishment of the Commission on International Religious Freedom, and the appointment of a special ambassador out of the State Department for International Religious Freedom. This commission was tasked with issuing an annual report to the State Department uh, with particular focus on countries that were in greater violation of religious freedom issues. This was intended to be bipartisan, so this was determined based on who, who appointed each commissioner. So I was appointed by President Clinton, uh, to serve on the very first commission. Other members were appointed by members of Congress and so forth. Um, but it should be said that the major impetus for the whole Religious Freedom uh, Act, as well as international religious freedom, was really driven by the Christian right and their allies at the time, whose main focus was really on the treatment of Christians in different countries, especially at the time in South Sudan who were subjected to abuse, including allegations of slavery at the hands of the leaders in the, quote, Arab and Muslim North. And this context of us versus them, them being the evil Muslims who were enacting Sharia that suppressed people of all other faiths, was a lot of the background of many of the meetings that we had as part of this commission. Those who promoted it in the beginning were people like uh, Frank Wolf and Sam Brownbeck, 
uh, as well as Michael Horowitz from the Hudson Institute. Um, <clears throat> the other areas that were focused on uh, uh, got a lot of attention related to the treatment of religious minorities in former Soviet republics and former communist areas of Southeast Asia, with particular attention on China. But at the time, the other commissioners of this very first commission included Elliot Abrams, John Bolton. I didn't really know much about either of them until that uh, experience. Um, Archbishop Theodore McCarrick, Farouz Kazimzadeh, who was uh, with the Baha'i community, David Saperstein, uh, uh, representing uh, the Jewish community, and others. But this was, uh, I was much younger than I am now, quite naive, and I thought we were all on the side of promoting religious freedom and human rights for everybody, all the time, everywhere. That was not the case. Um, as I mentioned, there was constant reference to the Sharia, or Islamic law, without any knowledge thereof, and without even curiosity to know what that actually meant. So even when I uh, thought that it would be a good idea to have a an in-service, if you will, with the commissioners about what Sharia actually is and how you can't use such sweeping generalizations for such a huge concept. It was met with the, the question of why. Uh, and truly, there was ignorance among the commissioners. But, but I was successful in inviting <clears throat> John Esposito to give us a presentation because all of the meetings took place in Washington. But the, at the time, Elliot Abrams was the chair of this commission, and he felt, well, we need the alternative view. And so he insisted on having Bernard Lewis basically give the, uh, the opposing view, uh, or a different view of what Sharia was, as if we can't, as Muslims, just speak for ourselves and have whatever we choose for our representation. But that was the kind of atmosphere um, that was at play with this commission. Um, part of what they did was hold conferences and go on fact-finding trips, one of which involved the Middle East. And so I ended up, this was, like I said, a very challenging time for me, um, but I, I ended up submitting a paper to the, uh, the Center for Policy Analysis on Palestine. I'm going to just read some excerpts from that because it summarized what happened, and it also shows us how nothing really has changed in, in this time. <clears throat> so until the fall of 2000, Israel was not on the commission's agenda at all. Uh, my attempts to highlight numerous religious freedom violations that occurred in Israel and the occupied territories were unconvincing to other members. As I, uh, w There were no criteria for which countries to choose, which countries to focus on. It was really at the interest of each commission member, which was one of the flaws of the commission at the time. Finally, the eruption of the Al-Aqsa Intifada in response to Ariel Sharon's visit to the Haram al-Sharif prompted the commission to issue a letter to Secretary of State Madeleine Albright urging the government to denounce attacks on holy places uh, and restore access to religious sites but when legitimate security interests are met. So buying into this notion of every act of violence is, sub is justified by security concerns. Um, any attempts to blame, uh, to place blame on Sharon's provocative visit were quickly thwarted and the commission refused to criticize Israel's use of collective punishment, which bars thousands of Palestinian Christians and Muslims from reaching their houses of worship in Jerusalem. This is ongoing until today. And the importance of this also is for those who are just new coming into this conflict with the events of October the 7th, this was all written over 20 years ago, so it, it is its own moment in history, but it is relevant to what's happening today because this situation has only gotten worse. Um, the, the commission eventually decided to plan a trip to the Middle East because they really wanted to go to Egypt to talk about this, the conditions of Coptic Christians in Egypt and to Saudi Arabia to basically talk about the circumstances for any religious group in Saudi Arabia that was not Muslim. Um, and I suggested that that trip should include a visit to Israel, particularly in view of growing anti-U.S. sentiment in the region that would intensify in response to an official delegation condemning religious freedom abuses in Egypt and Saudi Arabia while ignoring Israel at such a critical time, thus confirming long-held perceptions of a double standard that consistently favors Israel. So several commissioners were in disagreement as to whether 
we should even go to Israel. Elliot Abrams refused to participate in that part of the trip. He went to Egypt and Saudi Arabia instead. Um, and they also wanted to just, at the end, have only comment on our findings in Egypt and Saudi Arabia without addressing Israel because we couldn't come to an agreement on our findings. Um, and I argued to do so would be disingenuous, making the trip to Israel serve as a fig leaf that would lend legitimacy to the Middle East trip while avoiding any criticism of the most well-established sacred cow in Washington. Ultimately, the commission used such an escape route. The detailed findings of the trips to all three countries were confined to internal documents, not accessible to the public but they did issue public statements with recommendations regarding religious freedom in Egypt and Saudi Arabia and did not issue any remarks about Israel and the occupied territory because, quote, it sees its study of the situation as a complex matter requiring additional work, as per Elliot Abrams in his testimony to the House International Relations Committee. So as I said, <clears throat> this was in, my father died in 2000, my daughter was born, that year, in 2001, we went on this trip to Palestine, and I was in the mosque, the Dome of the Rock, of which we saw pictures, and I had a, actually my first emotional breakdown since my father had passed away, feeling that this was the reason I was there. He died believing in everything in Palestine, whatever it was, however it was going to come to be, even if everyone else objected to Oslo, if that meant he could go back to Gaza and start to reestablish the airport there or build clinics there, he would do whatever it took. Um, but he died suddenly, um, and so I felt like this was a sign that I needed to continue. But <clears throat> the, this was the weeks before my term was about to end, and the team, Elliot Abrams and everyone on the commission knew that if they didn't issue a statement, it would be too late for me to issue my own. So I knew that and prepared a dissent. Um, and I talked about the religious freedom violations that occurred in Israel, such as the con in Israel, the control of the, by the Orthodox rabbinate over most religious affairs, marriage, conversion, burial, circumcision, resulted in serious discrimination uh, against non-Orthodox Jews and non-Orthodox religious groups Jewish, Muslim, and Christian received only two to four percent of the religious affairs budget for maintenance and restoration of houses of worship, religious services, educational programs. Palestinian Christians and Muslims face widespread and systematic discrimination throughout Israel with respect to property ownership, education, employment, and government representation. The law of return, which grants automatic citizenship to anyone of Jewish heritage, which is loosely defined, is inherently discriminatory on the basis of religious identity. In East Jerusalem and the remainder of the occupied territories, discrimination against the non-Jewish population compared to the treatment of Jewish settlers is most egregious in terms of distribution <clears throat> of resources, allocation of social services, law enforcement, protection afforded by security personnel. This is in 2001 I wrote this. Hopefully you all have been paying attention to the news and see that this is ongoing and worse today. House demolitions and Jewish occupation of Palestinian Christian and Muslim sections of Jerusalem result in a form of ethnic cleansing designed to rid the city of its non-Jewish population. <clears throat> in addition, the ongoing siege throughout the territories impedes the right to worship in Jerusalem and elsewhere such as Hebron, while Jews continue to have unfettered access to holy sites in the same areas. Finally, while assaults on houses of worship of all faiths have increased, a particular concern are the attacks by Israeli security forces against religious sites such as mosques in the occupied territories in contravention of international law and without any official condemnation. <clears throat> the full text of my dissent was, was on the website up until a point. I'm not sure if it's still there. Uh, but I felt that it was very important to document those things for the record, especially because we had traveled there. <clears throat> but. There was not consensus to be even to be able to, to, to issue this statement in this report. Um, and so <clears throat> I felt very strongly that I had to at least get this word out in other ways. But I sort of conclude my thoughts by saying that, um, you know, the blatant and willful ignorance of Israel's human rights abuses permeates all levels of government. The choice of the commission, of, of this commission to uh, to do the same, serve to undermine its credibility and, uh, at home and abroad, 
where our tax dollars finance these endeavors. The many activists at the time within the human rights community viewed the international religious freedom movement with skepticism, uh, resisting efforts to create a hierarchy of human rights that emphasizes religious persecution, however it is defined, at the expense of others equally serious human rights violations. But, but as I wrote here, this movement is here to stay. It's now been 25 years since the establishment of the commission. And I wrote, therefore, those who care about religious freedom for Palestinian Christians and Muslims should continue to apply pressure so that appropriate attention is given to the suffering of thousands that is at least on par with, if not exceeding, that which has been addressed by that commission elsewhere at the time. Um, this was a very hard experience for me, just as I said, trying to balance so many things plus dealing with my overall emotional state. But I felt at the time, given that there was very little access of Muslims in government at the time, that I had no, no alternative but to do the best I could to represent our interest. And I felt that my role was to, to highlight religious persecution of Muslims, including Muslims who live in Muslim countries, because there was this assumption that if you were Muslim and you lived in a country that controlled every aspect of religious life, that somehow you weren't persecuted, whether that was in Iran or Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> to provide objective information about Islam and Muslims, since there was and still is a desire to paint Muslim culture, civilization, governance, religion uh, with one brush and to oversimplify who we are as a, as a people, as a community. And to point out the double standards when it came to calling out human rights abuses of some places and not others. So I hope and you know, my commitment was to fulfill that, which I hope that I did. Um, but it's very sad and distressing to see that I could have just written this today and it would still be relevant, which shows the fact that there really hasn't been traction within our own government to make a difference when it comes to religious freedom, religious persecution, and treatment of others um, because of how we are afraid to address some of the issues that are happening in Israel. But right now, a genocide is happening you can't call it by anything else. Over 1% of the population of Gaza has been killed. That's not counting the people buried under the rubble. This is not the time for us to mince words, to be evasive, to, to be sort of apologetic. This is happening on our watch. Just had news, six more people from my family, including five children, were killed in, a, in an attack on a house in Rafa because that's where they fled to. They didn't do anything wrong. So this is extreme collective punishment, the use of disproportionate excessive force, all of which are against international law. And if, it, if this isn't enough to get people to say something, to demand a ceasefire, to, to end this once and for all, this subjugation and dehumanization of the Palestinian people, I don't know what is. But what happened in, in you know, 20 years ago was a moment in history that I felt was important at the time. Did it prepare me for this? I don't think so. I, I'm, I'm at a loss, but I'm appealing to all of you and to the people you know to have courage, like the people of Gaza have shown incredible courage. They have shown faith because they don't understand what's happened to them, so they're putting their faith and their trust in God because they don't know what else to do. But we have tremendous privileges here right now by, by being in this kind of uh, setting, and so I really ask you to use that privileges, privilege and to, to stand up and, and show courage, even if it's not, if it makes you feel uncomfortable. So that's what I would leave you with, and I want to thank you for the chance to be here today.